In the tunnel. In the tunnel. In the tunnel. You're listening to In the Tunnel. Welcome to In the Tunnel, episode number 107. Remember when I used to be able to make puns on the spot for the numbers? Can't do that with, like, three numbers. Yeah. Like, 107 just doesn't have anything to rhyme with. It's just hard enough to say the three words. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, we're going to look at some trades today. Um... Over overdue but you know uh that's that's what we do it's like last week tonight but uh like last three month weeks too late <laughs> yeah. last month happened now yeah. Um, yeah actually makes more sense uh for our show name but you know we're what, five years in so okay. yeah um uh so yeah y- you want to take this one or should i yeah, yeah so uh brooklyn gets rid of irving uh yeah in this trade it's to dallas right so uh to dallas gets irving and morris uh brooklyn gets dinwiddle F- finley smith din din uh, you know, uh, let, me, let me just take it let me just take it. i mean i'm trying to read fast and i just didn't see the i dot <laughs> well you also said finley so <laughs> yeah all right so Brooklyn got rid of, as Sean said, got rid of the biggest cancer that they could have. Uh, Kyrie yep. Irving decided that it was his time to go because instead of being a good Samaritan and just taking his his, uh, his lashings in terms of what the Nets wanted him to do after the cryptic tweet and all that stuff, uh, he as soon as... He was back on the team, and the Nets were actually playing the best basketball that they had really played in yeah. the time that Durant and Irving have been together. Kyrie said, well, I know a bad thing when I saw, see it, and said, fuck the good thing. He demanded a trade. Um, demanding a trade when you're at the best spot that you've been at in three years is certainly an interesting narrative, but... You know, I guess that's something he couldn't look past. So, um, and it needs to be said that the Nets owner is the real hero in this deal because Kyrie only wanted to go to the Lakers. And so Joe Sy, the Nets owner, said to the GM, trade him anywhere but the Lakers, which I think (laughs) is a move that more teams should do. Yep. You know. I think that there's so much leverage for the players in the league that it's like, well, you don't want to be here. There's 29 other areas that you could go to. And I think as if you don't have a no trade contract, I should be able to do whatever I want, wherever you go. Yep. And so I think Kyrie had a limited no trade, but I was like, he wasn't going to go to the Lakers anyway. So, yeah, he ended up waving it to go there. Um, Dallas gets Markeith Morris, too. That's just a throw-in for the cap space. Uh, Brooklyn gets back Spencer Dinwiddie, who um, I think is a native of the Brooklyn area. If not spent a large amount of time uh, as part of growing up uh, in that area. Okay. Um, they get Dorian Finney-Smith. They get a 29 first-round pick. In two future second round picks. Now, I will say what stands out to me here is we're, we're we just got to 2023, and to accept a trade where the most important trade asset that you have, I guess, is six years away is a lot. I mean, like when Chris Paul got traded to the Suns from the Thunder, like I'm pretty sure the Suns traded away like a 2021 first round pick in 2020 and that was for a 36 year old player so for Kyrie to uh, 
be worth that little to have to defer on drafts for the next five years is certainly an interesting thing. I mean, um, when you look at like his outer image, based on whatever's been going on in the general eye, and how little he ended up playing until recent, uh, fairly recently, I-, I would say his prospectus was pretty low comparatively to what it should have been or could have been. His, his value turned into an elite player to an elite player who we need to get off of our head. Yeah. Because it, it's not the problem of the player he is. It's everything that comes with it. It's, also it's the, the baggage. That it's also the fact that the baggage seems to be everywhere he's gone. Yeah. Uh, he didn't like the people in Boston. So even though he said he was going to resign in Boston, he didn't. When he was with the Cavs, he he didn't like being second fiddle. Um, to yeah, LeBron, okay. Right? You remember in, he said he didn't like being second fiddle to, to LeBron and the Cavs, but he yes, wants to go to L.A. where he would not be, he would basically be second fiddle. He'd be second fiddle, and if Anthony Davis was ever healthy, he would have been third. Although, the, the rumor is the Lakers would have given up on Anthony Davis to get Kyrie. So, Still uh, second fiddle. Is, it's yeah, still second fiddle. It also doesn't solve anything for the lake. Yeah, because they were going to get rid of uh, Russell Westbrook anyway, too. Mm-hmm. So it, it, essentially, the Lakers would punt on a big man combination for a big man, small man combination, and then fill in the pieces with again what? Yeah, um, true. So it, it was an interesting way that the Lakers wanted to do it. And Kyrie wanted to do it, but nobody was really seeing how it was going to work long term. Um, but that wasn't really the only move that Brooklyn made. Um, although I will say that in regards to Kyrie, I mean, we know he was a guy, a new, not a native, but grew up in New Jersey after uh, being born in Australia. Uh, this guy came to the net saying that this was his childhood dream. And I get that when you get to the NBA, you know, the fandom kind of runs out. Yeah. You're not really a fan anymore. But, like, for a guy who claimed that he wanted to be there and claimed that this was his childhood coming true, he did everything in his power for three years to not play. Yep. I know. that. That's the other he, thing. It's like he had the audacity to say, "It's not my fault." New York says I have to be vaccinated to play basketball. So there's nothing I can do. Well, I mean, what, what did the rest of the world do so that they could live a normal life? They got vaccinated. To say that you couldn't do anything is ridiculous. Um, to, and to this day, he still is playing the victim, despite the fact that he literally had the right to choose. Any and everything he did. Yeah. Oh, the, the Nets community in the front office treated me poorly. After you tweeted something that was controversial. Literally pissed all them all off. to do was not tweeted. Like, we all have choices to make in life. Like, and you I decided mean, to not make them. I mean, also, like, I, I really think that if your image matters so much to your worth, like... Just especially if you have as much money as these top tier basketball and other sports figures do, hire someone to vet everything you say. Exactly. Let's not also forget that Kanye West uh, said that he could say anything he wanted and Adidas wouldn't do anything, and Adidas dropped him immediately. Yeah. Not not a week after that. After Kanye, one of the people he mentioned as being the same controversial person, people, was Kyrie Irving. Yeah. And Kyrie Irving could not separate himself from the news and just keep hush. He decided to play it up, do something controversial like 48 hours later. Yeah. And was, I guess, thought like he was still entitled to everything they had built. Now, not to take away everything he built, but. Like, it, what did you think was going to happen? You thought Nike wasn't going to drop you? Of course Nike dropped you. Yep. Like, 
What the heck you is know, that? Everybody has decisions to make in life, and those who don't make the right decisions have to face consequences. Those who choose not to do anything. If I saw two homeless people fighting in the street, and somebody, one of them was pulled out a gun, and I did nothing about it, then the consequence is I have to feel guilty with knowing that I didn't, yeah. you know, say anything or report anything. I didn't have to get in the line of fire, but I probably should have called the police. Yeah. Like, you know, we all have to live with the decisions that we make. And even doing nothing sometimes is the wrong thing. Yep. All right. Uh, and they got two future second round picks. Uh, do we even know when they will be? Uh, I can look that up. Um, bear with me a second while I do that. Yeah. Kyrie and again, Morris is just kind of there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the, both of the Morris brothers have played for just a plethora of teams mm -hmm. at this point in time. So, like, neither one of them is more than a role player. Um, the second round picks 2027 and 2029. Yeah, okay, those are worthless. Uh, I mean, 2027 is... Well, their second round picks are worthless to begin with. Yeah, but, like, four years isn't the worst, but, like, six years, come on. Four years for a second round pick is the worst. If you can't get rid of second <laughs> round picks now, how fucked up are your draft assets that you're like, oh, we have to hold on to this? Like, But it's not really that. It, it, it shows players. the worth of Irving more than anything else. Right, but... Does Kyrie Irving give a shit? No, no. he got what he wanted. Well, he doesn't give up. Not really. He just he pick. he he got to Dallas. That second round pick could become the best thing that ever happened to basketball, and Kyrie Irving would not give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> now I will say, also, and I you know I don't want to rant too long about this guy, but he is a free agent at the end of the year, which is probably one of the reasons why a lot of teams wanted him, because mm -hmm. as we said earlier. This guy takes drama everywhere, and the fact that he's a free agent after this year means he gets to... He, he won't be in Dallas long enough to spark the world on fire, and if he does, it's Dallas. And it's like, his beliefs at this point in time probably more aligned with a, with a more conservative landscape anyway. Um, at least, you know, he won't be hated by the local community as much. He'll still be hated, but, like, you know, that's more the reach of the game than it is, uh, you know, the local community. All right, and the other Nets trade. So, I mean, it was, like, a, a four-team deal or something, right? So, straight up. Oh, it was straight up? Didn't they? Uh, there were talks about it involving more. Oh, they flipped. Flipped later. Things happened, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah. Kevin Durant comes to my son's. Um, it's an interesting move because... Um, also, we have to mention TJ Warren, who was originally drafted by the Suns, who's making a solid $1 million this year, is uh, now back. Yep. Um, Jay Crowder... He hasn't played for us all season because he's a 32 year old uh, man who believed he was owed an extension despite being able to make $10 million this year. He was died was owed an extension despite the fact he's nowhere near a star caliber player. He's probably somewhere on that line of six man or starter, like okay, very fair. Friend. Um, and and Cam Johnson was going to start this year over uh, Jay Crowder anyway. Um, so he felt insulted by that side. He wasn't going to show up. Uh, Mikael Bridges was the third option on the team, sometimes the fourth behind Booker, then uh, Paul, then Aiton. But when a lot of injuries happened, they wanted Bridges to step up. And um, the reason why this trade happened now and not over the summer was the Suns didn't want to get rid of Bridges. Yep. They were going to get rid of everything else but Bridges. The Suns had a new owner, and 12 hours into his tenure as the owner said, get it done. Um, so they offered up Bridges. And with that comes Cam Johnson. Um, to Nets fans, Bridges and Johnson are affectionately known as the Twins because they're like best friends. 
So in my heart, I'm happy that they got traded together. Um, this is an interesting one because now, you know, Phoenix was in a good spot because they owned all their first round picks. Now they don't. Going forward. Now they don't. And look, Kevin Durant is a top 15 all around player of all time. Yeah. But what what's interesting here is Phoenix at its height was in the 2021 finals and last year is at its height because of the overall team chemistry and because everybody knew their role really well. Mm -hmm. Um, What you do now here is you risk the chemistry aspect going away for a brighter future, but you do it in the hands of a guy who's 34 years old and he does have leg injury issues. Yeah. Um, the flip side of that is it's widely known in the NBA that uh, if there's any team, historically speaking, at least over the past 20 years, that's had the best training staff, it is the Suns. Um, they were able to keep Steve Nash playing on a nightly basis, and he basically had a broken back yeah. and was laying on the sideline doing exercises every time he came out of the game. So... It, my hope here as a Suns fan is the intertwining of the best training staff and the willingness to want to win a championship is going to be enough to do that. But the reality of the situation is the bench is now weaker and it wasn't that strong this year to begin with. Fair. Um, so, yeah. I mean, do you think it's that. Get rid of. So do you think that like tr- trading those three players were Crowder, Bridges, and Johnson plus the f- four first round picks? Do you think um, that like it hurts the future more than you want it to, or yes and no? Because the there's two sides of this as well. Because Chris Paul is 37, 38 years old, and I think they're looking to probably move on from him after this season because I think only the first two years of his extension was this, with the Suns was guaranteed. Okay. Um, so they'll be on the hook for less if they're able to move him. And also Chris Paul, he's shown this year to not kind of be the same player. His, along, his longevity was the reason why he got a four-year extension after the 2021 season. Okay. Um, But should they move on from Chris Paul, if they, regardless of if they take on most of the salary or not, Phoenix now with Devin Booker, DeAndre Ayton, and Kevin Durant for the next, I think, three years, is probably the most appealing destination for free agents to go okay fair Uh, so the the question is you know what tier free agents are going to take less than the maximum to go to phoenix and um i I think you can get solid i won't say a tier but you'll get some solid b tier above average players who will Uh want to win a championship Okay. Um, yeah, you don't have really draft picks here, but the thing is about first round draft picks is once they get to year four or five, once they get to their option years, the pay scale drastically changes in yep. the NBA. So you're looking at a guy who, with a first round pick, probably makes, I'm going to guess here, five to $10 million in the first two to three years um, average. But that can jump to like fifteen twenty, yep. You know, with options. So really, the Suns won't have room for these guys. They're they're rental players if they keep the picks because if they don't pick up Durant. They have Booker on a super max. They matched Aiton's max, and they have Chris Paul on thirty million a year. So. Okay. Yeah, I I would. And and that bridges on uh thirty million a year too, or just short of that. Okay. So yeah. 
Um, it's an interesting trade. It really only pays off if the Suns win one. Fair, and the uh, Brooklyn is, you know, in in whatever shape they are in anyway. Yeah, it's a league of big threes. A lot of teams have big threes. It's just the tiers of them right now. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. All right. Especially the rest. Yeah, let, let's talk. There were a lot of trades, but not a lot of big trades. Um, you, you want to take the last one? or I feel like I've been talking a lot here. Yeah, so, I mean, you have the Lakers. They get uh, D'Angelo Russell, Beasley, and Vanderbilt. Yeah, Jared Vanderbilt and Malik Beasley go to the Lakers. Yeah. You have uh, the Jazz who get uh, Russell Westbrook. Uh, Juan Cristiano Anderson. Thank you. Damian Jones and a 27 first-round pick from the Lakers. And then you have the Timberwolves that get uh, Mike Connolly. Uh, mm-hmm. Nikhil Alexander-Walker. Thanks. Uh, 24 Lakers second-round pick and the 25 and 26 second-round pick from the Jazz. Yeah. So... I this mean, is, I'm, you know that they're getting rid of. I, I mean, I kind of, it, it's kind of known that they were going to get rid of Westbrook mm-hmm. here. So, um, you have a, a three team trade. I, I think it was kind of expected. But yeah, I think at well, the same time, ex- I'm like, well, okay, well, what does this kind of do? Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I don't see it, at least immediately. <laughs> So I think for Lakers fans and what the Lakers front office probably hoped for, for that, because we knew that Westbrook was going to be a trade chip somewhere. We knew that they only had the 2027 and 2029 first round picks yep. to play with in terms of trade assets, really, those three things. And we, we've known, as we've spoken on in prior episodes, about how the Lakers thought that really with that package, they could just get about anybody that they want. Mm-hmm. Which, it, it turns out, really not worth exactly what they thought. Nope. Because to get rid of Russell Westbrook meant getting rid of one of the first-round picks. Um, because yeah. just... Teams didn't want to take Westbrook on. And even now, uh, what Russell Westbrook has been bought out from the Jets. Yeah. Um, so D'Angelo Russell, who was drafted by the Lakers, comes back. And he's fine. He, he's a fine player. But I mean, who... like, you go from the Lakers being like, well, Russell Westbrook's an asset to in reality, right? You have a team that takes a first round pick to basically hold on this contract and then buys him out and just takes the penalty. <laughs> because what's Russell Westbrook worth to them? Yeah, they're it's it's literally nothing. Anyway. Yeah. Like the Jazz are already in playoff shape and they're supposed to be rebuilding anyway. They got a shit ton of picks for Rudy Rudy Gobert. They got a shit ton of picks for Donovan Mitchell. And they just got another first round pick from the Lakers. Yeah. And like the sad thing is for a rebuilding team all the trade chips that they got back, they're winning. So, <laughs> like, they're only going to get stronger. But the thing is, is, like, the Lakers, I'll admit, overall, in terms of the overall lineup with bench, like, roster-wise, gets deeper. But, like, there's nothing there that's a real differentiator from the times where they made the playoffs like in 2021, and then just couldn't do anything with it. There's nothing that this team, like, Jared Vanderbilt, I guess, is a good player. He's not going to make or break anybody's playoff run. Mm -hmm. Malik Beasley is a good player. Yeah. Not going to do it. And D'Angelo Russell is capable enough of being a starter, but he, when push comes to shove, he's proven to be inconsistent enough to – Probably not be able to handle, you know, being the third option on a team. So yeah, I would agree. I don't, I I don't know where this leaves the Lakers. <laughs> uh, they they picked up Mo Bamba for Patrick Beverly, which is like 
Mo Bamba was a top five pick, but if the Magic are getting rid of him for one player and no picks, then that says a lot about the player. Um, Fair. Like, yeah, the, the the Jazz clearly win this. The the Timberwolves are in a weird spot because, like the Jazz, they're now in the Mike Conley experiment. Who Mike Conley's now past his prime, and like the Timberwolves are in a spot where they have Anthony Edwards, they have Rudy Gobert, they have Carl Anthony Towns. In theory, they should be winning. So to be parting with players is an interesting move, but you know, you do get second round picks back. But they're worthless. They're worthless. But again, like I said with the Suns, what are they gonna do with first round picks? Fair. They, I agree. They, they have Towns go bare yeah. and eventually they're go on, on big contracts. Eventually they're going to have to give Anthony Edwards. It was I think in his third year of big contract. So you know, eventually they're not going to have money to play with. True. So that's where you fill out the roster with second round pick. Okay. Um, that leaves us with the buyouts. So uh, right before we uh, recorded this, um, Monday night, the 20th, uh, we know Patrick Beverly has decided after his buyout with Orlando that he is going home to Chicago because Lonzo Ball can't move his arms. And that's not a joke. He he's injured, and apparently they're going to shut him down because he isn't able to. Or, I don't know if it's arms or legs, but the, I think I read he he's unable to make lateral movements right Oof. now, which is very important in the game of basketball. Yeah. Um. So, uh, I don't know if Beverly's going to start there, but uh, he's going to for sure get minutes. Um. Kevin Love signed with the Heat earlier today after being bought out from the uh, Cavaliers, um, which was really a nice move because the Cavaliers decided not to really play Kevin Love anymore. Um, Reggie Jackson was the first domino to fall on the buyout market. He pretty much signed with the Nuggets immediately after he was traded from the Clippers to Charlotte and then bought out. Um, Terrence Ross. Kudos to him. The guy spent the last seven years in Orlando. So just a fucking long time to spend in Orlando, given that Dwight Howard era Orlando magic had been long gone by then. Uh, I think the the highest that Orlando ever was was an eight seed. So he uh, he served his time. They wanted him to go, you know, chase some wins. Uh, he was going to go to the Mavericks until Monty Williams and James, or not Monty Williams, uh, G- GM James Jones and the new Suns owner, who, as I said earlier, has been on the job less than a week, started yeah. making personal phone calls to Terrence Ross. And they were able to convince him to, you know, come to Phoenix, which I think, you know, adds a lot of value to the bench. Russell Westbrook signed with the Clippers earlier today. Uh, John Wall, who was on a two-year deal with the Clippers uh, and said that the Rockets were trash, uh, was traded back to the Rockets. He is being bought out. Uh, we don't know where he's going to go yet. Serge Ibaka was bought out from the Bucks, and Will Barton was bought out by the uh, Wizards. So those are the big names that are left on the buyout market. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all the names we expected. Yeah. All right. You you know the buyout market because if you follow trades closely enough and you see, oh, this contending team or this out-of-the-loop team just traded a player to a team that's nowhere near contending. Yeah, but like... like if you know players going to Charlotte, I feel like there's a good chance they're not staying. But I feel like the buyout market is really only a thing in the NBA. Mm-hmm. At least... Because that's the only league where players where the teams have enough money to play with it. Yeah. Like, the NHL a buyout would work, but I mean, right Nobody's now... Nobody's gonna sack the, like, twice the length unless they have to. Right, like... 
the NBA, a buyout mean is, you know, a, a good way to get rid of a player that's not part of your future. In the NHL, the salary cap is low enough to where a player can't take up more than 18% of the cap. So, uh, so like, say a guy making $4 million gets traded, you have to eat that contract. And well, if you, you buy out, contract, you get like a half of the player's cap hit per year in right, but penalty. You still have, that's still a, a guy making $4 million a year is making, you know, if you pay half of that, $2 million in the NHL gets you a solid piece. Yeah. yeah. And just eat that contract isn't feasible. No. So that's a difference in status. Yeah. All right. And speaking um, of the NHL. Yeah. You want to take this one? No, I want you to take this one. I just took all of basketball. Uh, yeah, anyway. So we have with the uh, All-Star game, what, like a month ago by now? 17 days. 20 days ago by now, basically. So 17 exactly. Oh, God. Well, by the time this goes up. I wanted to report last week. I just forgot to text you. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so the um, 23 All-Star Game is going to Florida, uh, specifically Sunrise. To Florida. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, well, I don't know. It's... I just, it feels weird when you see hockey in a place with a bunch of sunshine and no snow. Yeah, I mean, amongst other things, like, and we'll get into what what we were actually planning on talking about with the All-Star Weekend in itself, but, um, yeah, it, it's always weird to push tourism to a place where tourism already is very prominent. Yeah. It was like, I mean, the only thing about Sunrise, California, or see, I even said California. That's how little this makes sense. Um, <laughs> Sunrise, Florida is like, it, it is, I guess, you know, a few miles away from the beach. No, no, it, it's like almost next to it, but it's basically, it's just above Miami. Like, you're already next to the beach, you're already in a. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. It's. It, it, so it, it's tough because I understand hockey has to go where the money is. Hockey has to go to where they can grow the game. But, like, this is all the reason why you can't go to Columbus because, even though they did, Columbus is small enough of a city to where it doesn't grow the game. But yeah. it, it does get those who are in into sports to be engaged with the game so on one hand you sacrifice growing on a large scale to attract a concentrated area the problem is where the large areas or large scale areas of potential audiences are is really where you you can't grow the game. New York is already taken care of. But I LA is like care of, the thing is, I still think the NHL is in a weird spot where, like, yes, they have teams in these places, but they can totally still grow the game. They're not sad, like they're not fan saturated anywhere but Canada and maybe like Buffalo and like the the northern U.S. As closer to the Canadian border you are, the better off you. Um. Yeah, like, Which Minnesota is, is probably saturated, and, like, I, if you put an NHL All-Star game in LA, you probably can still grow the game, just not in the way you're expecting, like, and obviously it won't be as much as Florida, because, like, who in Florida watches these games, but there are so many people in LA or New York that if you're telling me you can't get new fans, you're just lying, I think. Let me share with you a little personal anecdote that I think ties in here. You know, we're both from New Jersey. Um, and when I moved down to North Carolina and, you know, I, I would meet people, go on dates with women, whatever it was. And a lot of the dates that I would go on were northern transplants who also moved down to North Carolina. 
a, a lot of people will trade cold for warm. Yeah. And so the the message here is the NHL cannot afford to go to warm weather climates and say, I know what the number one draw should be is, is to go to the place where it's coldest and that'll bring the people. But I'm not they saying to go to Canada not, because I agree no, no, that you're... I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that everything should be Pittsburgh and North. No, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is you have to find a way in. You have to find an appeal. It's, again, they use the dating metaphor. You, you have to find the love that, like, the love triumphs the other locations. You know, if you're in North Carolina and you want to live in New York City, but you're madly in love with somebody in North Carolina, you got to hope that that yeah, but love for that the, person. The thing is, like, okay, well, why, why Florida, right? The team is okay, not that good. Like, okay, if you made it Tampa, that's a difference, right? Tampa's doing good. It draws people. You could probably get, like, you're going to see a lot of tourism coming with this and all that. But the like Florida, like Miami, like even if you chose North Carolina at that point, like the team's doing so well, it's drawing people in. It had its stadium series game that definitely grew the game. It had like 56,000 people there or some ridiculous number. At a college stadium, but yeah. Yeah, but that's the point. Like, I just don't necessarily agree with going to Miami, not saying that you can't you you have to be in new york i feel like you you just choose you can choose a better location not so Go ahead. not necessarily like miami florida so my thinking is and you know a lot you know sports leagues are very competitive but i think if they could pull it off the smartest thing that they could do and this is just off the top of my head so it may not be the smartest thing overall is hockey should be cross-promoting cross through the channels of the media deals that they have. Um, yeah, but because they can't. They, they should, if they could, though, they should be cutting the tourism check part because spending big money to go to a warmer climate doesn't mean anything. Post the All-Star game in a smaller city and then... You have ESPN and TNT, and you should, you know, what is the most befuddling thing here is ESPN, ABC, and TNT Turner have access to the number one biggest sport in the world in the NBA. And if they could so much as get the CGI graphics on the scorer's table table at a basketball game instead of saying uh next wednesday night at 10 30 jazz versus nuggets if they could instead promote a hockey game on espn two days from now instead of an nba game nine days from now then that makes everybody win it grows viewership for hockey it grows viewership uh, on ESPN, on Turner, it would do great things. And the NHL uses their monetary budget much more wisely because all the people, if you get on Twitter and you look at Bleacher Report, every time Bleacher Report puts up something that's a hockey highlight compared to a basketball highlight, all the replies are filled with hockey is not a sport. Well, hockey's not being promoted as a sport. Hockey is being promoted as an extracurricular for when there's nothing else. So if hockey could promote themselves, but just this is a the NBA, but they, they can't. Platform, but they can't because hockey is too localized in market, right? Like you have okay, and there's also that TV local TV thing going on where something is going on. I don't remember. They're all bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. sports owns most of them in their bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. so check. so this is okay. This is good and bad for if they they can do the right thing with this. But the problem is, 
the localization of the broadcast, right? The reason that NHL TV sucks also um, is everything is localized. That's why we still have so many blackouts and things cover certain areas, right? Once that, like, in in order to truly grow the game, if you want ESPN to be able to to, to advertise the next game, you got to you got to figure out how to get rid of blackouts, at least as egregious as they are right now. Yes, but blackouts don't mean anything if people aren't watching anymore. Anyway. Yeah, but Both. the blackouts prevent people from like it's just not on NBC cuz it's blacked out. Like what? That's true. But the other thing I will say is you speak of local networks. I will also say, you know, out here in Pittsburgh is AT&T Sportsnet. Every intermission for a Penguins game is a commercial about Inside Pirates baseball. The local regional networks cross-promote, and it's not just because they have the teams to do it. It's not because the Penguins... Uh, the same network that the Penguins on has the Pirates. It's because they grow their viewership if they promote both. Yeah. So that's what allows me to think if it works for regional, why wouldn't it work for national? All right. But, but ESPN, I... ESPN has so much to offer between college basketball, pro basketball, all this other It's in so that many like, things. It's so saturated that, like, that's why I think one of the things that the NHL did good was getting with Turner and, and TNT because they're not oversaturated. They don't have a college basketball game on until March, until March Madness. And even that is only two days a week until, you know, like, and that only happens for like three weeks. They have the NBA for like a few days. And I'd say largely, the ability to manifest because Turner has Bleacher Report to get uh, the NHL with Bleacher Report and uh, TNT has arguably in the last 10 years been the best thing that the NHL has done. Because, you know, and I I talk about this, uh, Paul Bissonnette a lot when it comes to hockey, but what worked for inside the NBA was having actual personalities hockey also is a very quiet personality game uh if you're not the fighter on the ice even the fighting fighters on the ice off the ice are the quietest people um so inside the nba had charles barkley and had Shaq, and thank god for paul bissonette because that man's personality is some like single-handedly growing the game to some extent for what it's able to do through the internet and media channels. But outside of that, there's not a lot of personality in hockey. Yeah. And you have to find a way to uh, really be able to market something outside of the game. Even ESPN's commercials are... Yeah, but ESPN, ESPN, like the problem with being on ESPN is, okay, well, what are they going to promote, right? Okay, uh, football, then NBA, because it makes money, then literally like wrestling, because it makes money, then whatever the hell, like it's so saturated, like you can't say that like, like having ESPN promote hockey will do anything. True, and I will say, like, look, it's a catch twenty two for the NHL to go back to ESPN because NBC Sports Network was folding. They they absolutely had to. They they needed a platform to distribute on a national stage, and you know, like I said, with Turner and TNT, Turner has shown that they don't do a lot of basketball. They're kind of content with their arrangement. And so getting NHL once or twice a week probably wasn't enough. And ESPN did have a bigger streaming platform available for those who do want to subscribe to ESPN Plus. But ESPN... Yep. But then again, it also gets family, uh, it, it ESPN, also gets blacked out. Well, ESPN is a family 
of networks in an organization is not no longer in a space where they can afford to develop with the lead. Um, you know, in, in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, ESPN was still growing to a point where it probably would have been a beneficial partnership. But ESPN understands that the NHL was the one who needed it most. And, like, you know, ESPN probably... We also... We're also on a big tangent. You want to get back to what we're... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We could go on this for like three hours. All right, here we go. Yeah, the skills competition. Like, anyway, let, let's conclude the thought, though, uh, before. Hockey in Florida only does so much. It doesn't really sell out the stadiums where teams are already hosting. Um, so to put tourism there and attract all the people who didn't need the warmth because they're hockey people to begin with to a warm climate is just the most befuddling thing. We're not saying put it in a place like Pittsburgh where it makes sense because people like hockey here. But we're saying you got to put the All-Star game in places where it makes sense. You're Everybody's very lucky that Vegas worked out because on paper – it made zero sense to put a team in Vegas. But There's hey, it worked. There's a million other things to do. It worked because of, unfortunately, some tra tragic events that brought everything together. Yeah. But now, yes, it, it eventually turned out to be a success. Now, with that being said, let's transition. Uh, you know, we, we do need to talk about the skills competition in All-Star Weekend itself. Um. The All-Star Skills Competition really changes every year, not always in the best way. Um, you know, I I watched the whole show, so to speak, um, and we were talking about it. Yeah. Not a lot of continuity in ESPN's first shot at it. Or second shot at No, first shot at it, first. because last year was uh, Olympics. Yep. Um, the what NBC networks had traditionally done very well was when they showed it, they went through an event. Boom, that event's done. We move on to the next one. Boom, it's done. ESPN decided to tease everything. We're going to start with the fastest skater. We're going to do the first two skaters of the opening round granted there's eight contestants we're going to do the first two skaters they're done okay now we're going to do the first player of the breakaway challenge he's done, he's done. now we're going to go to the second two uh uh skaters now we're going to go to the goalie challenge now we're going to go to the third two skaters and it's like for the love of god just have people running in a circle, I man. Don't, I, I don't want the fastest skater to be the first and last thing I see. I guarantee you the players have long since forgotten that it was even an event by the end of the night. Yeah. Like, it was like, you know, first of all, these are professional athletes, and the fact of the matter is they all have to prepare and warm up yeah. Get loose. It's all part of their routine. Granted, it's a skills competition. They probably don't feel the need to, but it's part of their routine to warm up, stretch, stuff like that. And if you're an, uh, even a casual watcher of the skills competition, you know they bring out extra benches on the ice because there's so many players for all the teams here, and everybody is sitting a long time. Yeah. So to say we're going to, you know, draw this out as long as possible does not help especially in cardiovascular exercises like this like you know sprint skating so yeah. it's an interesting way to go about things and um then the breakaway challenge which was like the breakaway challenge is the nhl's dunk contest but as as limited as the dunk contest has become it's 
way more limited in hockey. Yeah. Because there ain't no fucking dunking, and there's only so many ways to beat a goaltender. Like, yeah. It essentially could have more options to it if there's no goaltender, but then it's not impressive because there's no goaltender yeah. and anybody can score on an open net. Yeah. Um, but, you know, kudos to the players. They certainly try. But the other thing is... I mean, I think it's not just the skills competition. It's like the whole event. Like, how does the All-Star Weekend represent hockey in any way? Well, also, I will say for the All-Star Weekend, I do have to finish off and say, whoever they attract for the judges panel, like, the NBA, granted, again, very different standings. Yeah. They have their who's who of whatever celebrities they fucking want. And they can choose. They can choose WNBA players. They can choose NBA players, current alumni. They could choose rappers. They could choose anything. The NHL has to choose not Grammy nominated, but Juno nominated. Lesser, like, granted, I'm not trying to take anything away from accomplished artists in Canada. Drake is Grammy nominated, but he's from Canada. So we're we're going to say here, even Canadian artists want Grammys and not Juno. Um, so the lesser of that, you got two WWE guys who ever, I swear to God, these guys could not promote their own agenda more. Yeah, fact, literally. Like I don't know who the fuck these guys were because I don't watch the WWE. I think that shit's fake bullshit. I don't give a shit if you like the fact that it's fake or not. I think the fact that the WWE making you pay $60 to watch a story is just fucking weird. Um, So, yeah. These guys are judges. So every time after a a shot, what do you guys think? Well, you know, I think that you... It takes some strength to be able to do that. The strength that me and this guy have, and you can catch that Friday night on WWE. Like, I literally could not give a shit. They couldn't give a shit. Hockey in NHL has to find people who give a shit. They did a good job in bringing in the female hockey players, the female pros, because they understood women love hockey too, and it's grown uh, both of them. But, like, to bring in people who are only going to promote their own agenda is the dumbest thing you can do, especially in in the case that he probably is not better standing than hockey. Um, Not to mention they brought in a fucking uh, woman's tennis player, and every time ESPN was put the mic in front of her and was like, you know, that took a lot of creativity on that shot. What would you do if you were on the ice and she was like, she couldn't play along if her life depended. If I was on ice, the hell I would just you fall over. I be on ice? I'd just fall over. Like, could you fucking play along at all? Like, look, I have Asperger's. I have little creative energy, except for when it takes months to kind of think out an idea. And I was like, come on, like, I don't know, I'd do a loop-de-loop or some shit. Like, at least fucking, like, make some shit up. Yeah. Like, oh, I'd fall on my face. Cool. <laughs> Not really the open mic answer I was looking for. So, like, yeah. If, again, I'd go for that pirouette about, on ice. We, we talk about hockey needing personalities. They did bring in personalities for the WWE guys. Not the right personalities, but, like, you gotta bring in personalities who are actually going to boost the ratings and boost the game not put the fucking game to sleep um i mean you know the actual all-star game does that enough for me so i mean like we'll touch on that in a second but but like uh, i will say the the surfboard challenge that they had the surfboard dunk tank i i thought that was creative whoever thought about that one did a decent job You, you took hockey to the beach that's exactly what you should be doing. Yeah. Is saying this game can go anywhere. The ice. Like, that's absolutely yeah. what you should have been doing. They should have done the whole skills competition. You know, you're gonna be on uh on um what is it, rollerblades. 
We're going to do the fastest skater on rollerblades, and we're going to do it on the beach. Yes, that should have been done. Hardest shot. You could do the hardest shot anywhere. Why did you take everybody indoors? <laughs> the rubber puck knows no wind resistance. Just <laughs> fucking fire the thing. Do the Kramer shit. You know, we're, we're, we're going to put uh, tar- you know biodegradable pucks on targets uh, in the ocean, and we're just going to put buoys on them or something. Make the players hit the buoys. Yeah. The NHL lacks such originality that I just thought of four better ideas than they thought of with years of planning, and that was in two fucking minutes. All right. Okay, let, let's get to the actual game. You're going to have to take this one. All right. Well, anyway, so I don't know how much of the All-Star game you tuned into, but I basically tuned I'm into sure. the first game. And turned it off halfway through. Um, when the game is basically three people on the ice, just or six people on the ice, just dilly dallying around, going back and forth. It, I feel like okay, nobody's trying at all. Like nobody has to try it. Like get me, don't get me wrong. It's an all star game. Uh, it, well, I mean, after the NBA All Star game last night, where it was literally just. You know, a, a, a five on five and four players from each team were just diddling each other's, uh, yeah, you know, jerseys. So, like, I will say, even if the NHL doesn't try, the element of the game alone makes it so that but, it looks a thousand times better than the NBA. Yeah, but my problem is like, okay, but does this even show the game to a new player? Or a new a new watcher, somebody trying to get into the game. Like, what does this show that the af- actual game has? It this is three on three overtime, except sleeper. Yes, but the idea behind it was it was to show scoring. The reasoning behind it was years ago. But the problem when it is went away from five on five was that if you play five on five like a normal hockey game. People are going to expect the same 3-2 energy that was the same of any other game. Granted, we know that the All-Star game is way different in terms of even the old 5-on-5 was like at least 7-5. to I'm pretty sure it was like 10-7 to most cases. Yeah, which for hockey was high scoring. But this one was supposed to do more because it was supposed to generate more odd man opportunities. They did that, but... It makes a like it makes a slight mockery of the game. One of the teams didn't have a single defenseman. Yeah, yeah, as we covered on this very show. Yeah, and like, like and, and that was fucking what. Granted, it's the less sexy position. Yeah, of but it's the Atlantic. Do I can name four defensemen from the Boston Bruins that should have been on that team? Like a boy for sure. Um, yeah. Um, but I. I we do need to talk about the fact, you know, we said five on five versus three on three and how that changed. And I, I think we're both in somewhat of an agreement that when the NHL went from five on five to three on three, at that point in time, it was the right thing to do. Oh, yeah. Because it had gotten so stale. And as we've even seen with the NBA, the NBA changed it up and did the, uh, the draft. Uh, thing and the captain thing, which the NHL had done in the late 2000s. Yeah. But even the thing about the NHL was, you know, very much like the NBA. Like, once you got five on five, there's only so many pl- ways I to mean, play a basketball game. The, there's only so many ways to play a hockey game. To be fair, like, in terms of all star games, like, okay, MLB's all star game, does it still matter or did they take that away finally? Because it used to control who had home field in the uh, World, Series. World Series. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they took that away. But, like, okay, it was a reason to watch the game. And it still represents the game of baseball, right? In in theory, you still have everybody playing their positions. Uh, not a 100%, obviously. It's a show. Right? And it used to have some meaning. Not that it, most people cared for it, but it still represented the game fairly well. And the competitions they could do actually made sense, like the home run competition. 
Yeah, but knows how they haven't deviated from the home run competition because they understand there's only so many different ways to hit a baseball. Yeah, yeah. but then like okay, then you have uh, the uh, NBA, right? Okay, their their shooting competition makes sense. The dunk competition is literally just showmanship, and the actual All Star game makes like no sense. Yeah, and then yeah, and, and in fact, they made the drafting of the teams even worse because the NBA commissioner decided. We're going to draft all the reserves first and then the starters so nobody feels bad. And then literally had LeBron on stage as the final two players available are on the stage waiting to pick. The LeBron's going, hmm, hmm. Literally making these guys feel invalidated. Yeah, I know. I like, know. joke or not, he's stalling for effect. I know. But, okay, but, like, get back to my point, right? Like, okay, so so I think, like, in terms of all-star games, you have, like, the MLB, which has kind of figured it out. And then you have... Because they have nowhere else to go. Yeah. Then you have the NBA, which at least their skills competitions make some sense. Yes. And then you have the NHL, which, okay, the only competition that makes sense is maybe fastest shooter, but, like, eh, not really. And then the one, the accuracy one. Yeah, hardest shot used to be their uh, dunk contest, basically, because it was the biggest wow factor one. But the thing is, is people have grown to understand you can only shoot a puck so, so hard, hard yeah. before there's a cap on it. Like, you, you can keep breaking the record, but it's not like anybody is going to be able to, sh- you know, anybody who's body is built to be an NHL player, not like a bodybuilder or, yeah. or an extreme weightlifter is going to be able to shoot above and I'm going to say a bold number here, 115. Yeah. Like, I'm giving myself like a 5 mile per hour buffer over the, the record. Yeah, it's because like a 109 or 110. You need an element of technology or you need uh, the equipment or something. You need something to give for that one to have a more variable change. Yeah. But, like, aside from that, like, fastest skater doesn't really matter, right? Like Again, there's only so many. How how, how quick can you actually do but, it? The but it also doesn't mean anything, right? Like, the way you skate in a hockey game is not how you skate for fastest skater. Yeah, but the NBA, the NBA skills challenge where they throw a, a chest pass through a hoop from 30 feet away doesn't exactly mean anything either. So, like, you know, the NBA has their their challenges that have zero meaning, too. And granted, the dunk contest and the three-point shootout will always mean more than that. Um, but, you know, the NBA still toys around with stuff that has zero meaning, too. Yeah, but, but then you get to the... There's volatility there. Yeah, but then you get to the actual game. Like, okay, at least in the NBA, they play five players on the field, even though they kind of twiddle their thumbs, right? Then yeah, in the game. Yeah. you look at the NHL. Okay, you have two goalies out at a time. Like, they play for like 10 minutes, and it's literally just like a snooze fest. They're going around, they shoot, the goalie doesn't try to save, and keep going. Yeah, and the goalies are at an impasse here because... You know, the goalies want it to be their time, too, but they understand that nobody's watching for a shutout. Yeah. So they have to play subpar, yeah. even though their game is not to be. Yeah. So it, it, it makes and it's, a mockery it's of their position. It's different. Like, when you look at the NBA, like, okay, you, you have to play subpar defense, but, like, who over there is not already playing subpar defense? Right. That's what the NBA is now. Everything is subpar defense. Like, the number one team in the NBA defensively gives up 95 a game. And when we were children, and I'm not to... I'm pretty sure it was like 78. Yeah, not to be old man stares at, you know, ceiling or or at clouds or whatever, or yells at, you know, children. But, like, yeah, it was like a solid 15, 20 point difference in terms of what elite defense is. Like... Yeah. If you see an NBA game where one team, where both teams haven't scored above a hundred, you're games, witnessing some that's apocalypse. Struggling shooting. <laughs> you're witnessing so an like, apocalypse, in my opinion. If you see a game where both teams haven't eclipsed a hundred, something is wrong. Well, I'd say at least one team. At uh, least one team has to eclipse a hundred, and now nothing yeah. is wrong. <laughs> yeah, 
I, I, I was looking at Google. I, a Cavs Suns game like th- ten months ago was like ninety five eighty seven. I was like, what the fuck? Is that even possible anymore? I don't know. Apparently it is. Uh, but yeah, like I don't know. It, we're talking all star yeah, but then, overall. Then okay, then you have like the NFL All Star Pro Bowl, which nobody cares about. So like they are actually yeah, the they, worst. They've literally given up on that. Which yeah, was the right move. Like yeah. it was better when the, it was after the Super Bowl because, like, it was for football fans to be able to hold on to something and not have to give up on football. Yet. Ever since they changed that and put it above the Super Bowl and basically took everybody out of it, nobody gives a shit. Yep. Players don't care. There's there's nothing inspiring about being it. Also, the fact they took it out of Hawaii, which is like, you know, the players could go to Hawaii anytime they fucking wanted anyway. Yeah. But to be paid to be in Hawaii, that's a completely different story. But, like, nobody was going to give a shit about it before the Super Bowl. Yeah, so... I don't know. I really think that something has to change with the whole All Star Weekend, All Star Game kind of thing, but it's not my place. So we're gonna continue. Yeah. Well, no. The other thing we have to address is where does the All Star Game for the NHL go from here? Because I think we've kind of exhausted in our conversation here. For any sport, there's only so many ways to actually hold an All Star Game, and I think. For the first couple of years, this tournament style three on three was kind of cool, but um, in, in terms of seeing the best players on the biggest stage all at once, it's truly eliminated that. Uh, the appeal on a five on five is that you legitimately will see McDavid and Crosby go at it, you know, for twenty minutes a game. Whereas, yeah. you know, right now in its current format, McDavid and Crosby only meet for those 20 minutes if the 40 minutes beforehand actually break down to allow it. Yeah. And it's it's, it's like, kind of like you, you tune in, right? And you're like, ah, I want to see Ovechkin and Crosby, let's say. And they lose in 20 minutes. Like, okay, well, you just literally what just... Do you do with- that's the first game of the day. What do I do with, you know, my yeah. hopes for the next two hours? Yeah, like, it's a fundamental flaw in the way that they've laid it out. Yeah, it is. But it's like, you know, I understand changing it up, but, like, I I don't understand how they keep it fresh. I really, that's where I, I run yeah. out of ideas. All-Star Games only... Unless they're going to do something Pro Bowl-like and just replace the game with different events that are just completely not hockey-related, it makes no sense. Fair. And maybe they incentivize it in, like, you know, they used to do the hockey sauce kit toss as part of one of the skills competition things. Maybe they hang a sauce kit thing, top shelf, corner, on one of the nets, and if, you know... In the All Star Game, somebody hits it, uh, even with a goaltender in front of it, accounts for four, you know, four points. You know, if they, you know, add trickery into the game, it has potential to at least have some sports center top ten plays in it. Like the game as it is, only really has two or three options. Also, True. The fact they got to bring back the puck track. Like, yeah. NBC toyed with it for a hot second, but, like, older demographics... I mean, also, I think in the All-Star really game, you should have a puck tracker. Like, it's... The game yeah, is... Sl- game. Huh? Okay, well, at least get it right dirt. Like, it's the perfect time to put a puck tracker in, because the game is slower. Yeah, less people moving. There's Locked less in. people moving. The game is slower, so you're not going to have that hard shot. You're not going to have fast, crisp passes. None of that. It's the perfect time to iron out that thing so that it's actually usable in the real scenario. Because I do agree that, like, when NBC tried it the first time, it wasn't perfect. It wasn't perfect, but, like... And it was slightly it was distracting. It was pretty damn good. No. Well, that, like... That was pretty damn good. Like, no, in... Look, 
I'm not going to name which family members, but for me, I did have family members who I was watching it with say that it, it helped them a lot. Mm, fair. And, I... and uh, again, we're talking engagement overall above anything else. We're talking engagement and attracting different demographics and fan bases and stuff like that. You need the ability to draw in older demographics. I don't know. I think you you can I, take I it two ways, right? You hockey, can like, you can take it two ways. Like you can try and draw in the older demographic, or you can just try to go all in and try to draw in the well, younger they're, they're, demographic. Like, well, you, you do that too because the ADHD and the fact that scientifically speaking, everybody's attention span is shorter right now, and the best way to attract attention to somebody with a short attention span is with bright colors um yeah you you put a or a neon orange line on the ice bright colors people will yeah but that. the problem is they can't it's alienate, the alienate their current fan base right like okay if i had to watch a bright orange puck i would literally just turn the tv off like no not the puck the line that follows the puck yeah, yeah. Well, okay if i had to watch that i'm i'm turning the tv off man like like i want a way to turn it off <laughs> I think you that, the the problem is they won't do it because they don't want to alienate their current fan base. Like, okay, but like, at some point, technology has caught up with every other sports league except for baseball, which it'll it's never. Oh <laughs> baseball! But, uh, at some point, you have to let technology in to be successful. No, I'm not saying that. Like, it's not a worthy investment i'm just saying like if they force it on me i would rather just not watch or like if it's like so out there like the colors on a hockey rink are there and they're static like you know the red line the blue line the, the trapezoid is red like all these things are there now if they introduce another color and I, in your case if it's bright orange like I think it's going to clash too much. I haven't seen it, but like... And yet, overseas and on hockey rinks are literally just littered with advertisements. Mm. And those teams have not gone under for what reason? I mean, like, the point is that if you have an orange... Like, I'm just saying it's a line that's just following the puck, right? And I'm just saying this static thing isn't stopping teams. Yeah, but I mean, uh, that's a. You know, that's, I, I'm trying to. Like, successful. But I'm trying to look at the ice and follow the puck and the players, right? I just You're, think. And they're not doing that overseas? So, I mean, like, okay, ads is a different thing. Ads is also making the money. This is just a tracker. It's still college. But, like, my it's point is. People will fuck with an ice surface that's tons of colors and not just. You know, a McDonald's yeah, but ad the, the a point is ad. they're making like okay, how does a tracker make them money except for me viewing it, right? And getting more people to view it, right? An ad is paid for, okay? Like they're completely different. We have to move on from this because yes, the rabbit holes are just too much. Yeah, but like the point is that like if it only improves, if it only statistically may improve the experience without really feasibly making them money unless it's widely liked they're gonna do it less than something that somebody is paying for and they're also showing you all i'm saying is they eventually have to move from their current base to trying to add more yeah, no, no I, but I don't disagree. I'm just saying, like, the current iteration of it, and they, they actually have to think of how to put it in, right? They can't just go slap it on again. Because you know that they will do things wrong. All, I'm not saying it has to be the puck tracker, but I'm, like I'm saying, eventually you have to start figuring out how to add to what you already have in terms of a fan base and, uh, you know... The NBA had China. The NBA had the ability to grow the game internationally when it wasn't originally that. Mm -hmm. Hockey already is an international game. Yeah. So at some point, you have to 
open the door for something else to come in to grow the game in a way that you're not initially comfortable with. Again, it doesn't have to be the puck tracker, but it has to be something. Yeah. But in- maybe, it, maybe it's allowing players to have personnel. Yeah. I mean, that that's, again, that, that's different also. But, like, if we're talking about it's letting technology, things. like, there is sooner going to be advertisements on the ice because they would be paid for by companies than there is a puck tracker. <laughs> that's all I would say. Unless the puck tracker in itself is sponsored by somebody. Yeah. Which it could be. There's a million different ways to broadcast an advertisement. True. Uh, just like jerseys. But <laughs> All right. Uh, on to the trades. So we have one here. I do want to talk about the other one the Rangers made quickly. Um... Yeah. Turn that ambulance down, by the way. Yeah, it's an ambulance <laughs> behind me. What am I gonna do about it? You can do the New York thing. You can flip them off. Uh, <laughs> arm is a bitch. Anyway, so so the Rangers acquired Vladimir Tarasenko uh, and some other player for Sammy Blais, uh, Hunter Skinner, a uh, conditional. A first round pick in twenty three and a conditional fourth round pick in twenty four. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is amazing for the Rangers, and I hate it. But that's and you probably hate it too. But that's because we're Metro team fans. Honestly, don't give a shit. I think like, hey, the the Penguins are still technically in the playoffs. Well, no, the Rangers operate better when. The pieces that they bring in are veteran leaders on teams where they don't necessarily have leadership. And when I look True. at what the Rangers are, I see they're a very talented team that does not have leadership. When they brought in Martin St. Louis, that brought in leadership. What doesn't bring in leadership, but brings in more talent, is Vladimir Tarasenko. Vladimir Tarasenko has actively been anti-leadership yeah because statistically the past few years have been horrible for him let's not forget the fact that this guy was a perennial all-star when he was younger and he's still not very old of a player this year he's an all-star again for the first time in like seven years like he fell off a fucking cliff and he was it was right was it Ryan o'reilly who was the captain when they won the cup? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It was either that or I know Maroon was at no. least had to be wearing an A. Yeah, um, he was A. So, yeah. Tarasenko is not really a, a leadership. I don't think they actually need that. Like, they were actually missing scoring, which is weird to say. They had... Okay, if you look at their last five yeah, games, the only person on that sheet is Panarin. Yeah, but that's what they're paying Panarin top dollar to be, is the score. But so it's like the, that, okay, the other side most, is, at least he's doing his job. Yeah, but it's most goals, most assists, most points in the last five games. All Panarin. Well, let's also not forget that Capo Caca and uh, Alexis, Alexis Lepernier have both turned out to just... Uh, I, think, I think it's, it's a like problem with the play Rangers... Play development staff more than those well, yeah, two players. Yeah, they also fucked up Jimmy VC. Yeah. And so it's like, how many highly touted guys have to come in and be generational talents? Because that's what Lafreniere was supposed to be. That was the appeal behind the bubble in playoff teams having a chance at being number one overall. It was like, when is it ever going to be that a playoff team or like any playoff team has a chance to have a generational talent like this? That was the appeal. And Lafreniere has been extremely pedestrian, if not. Yeah. Um, but like, if you, know, you see. Not on the same level as VC, but. But if you see like the, the talent, like I don't see any talent or at least jet, like the talent that the Rangers try to bring up just doesn't exist. They go somewhere else and they're better. Yeah. But the Rangers have a development problem. 
they do because I mean historically speaking they have undrafted guys who do better than guys that they take Mark Stahl yeah Girardi I mean I I don't disagree with you but I'm saying that that is a problem with their pipeline that like I understand. I'm just saying it takes a guy with a motor in himself that isn't being tapped into. There's a guy who wants it badly enough to do it himself and figure it out with connections he has instead of relying but on the that team also to points. Do it but it's not even that. It's also like how are they trying to use these players? Like not in the right way. Exactly. They want them all to be superstars. But the thing is, regardless of the sport. You can't have all superstars. Somebody has right. to take But also, off. like, you have to, like, especially when you're developing these players, like, they are not immediate superstars. Like, you have to deploy them, especially if you're keeping them right. in the NHL, in the right way. I think there's this expectation that because McDavid and Crosby and McKinnon... Matthews. And actually, no, I won't even say McKinnon because McKinnon kind of had to grow, too. Yeah, but, but yeah, like Matthews if you Ovechkin, the most the two most recent examples one, is McDavid and Matthews, I think. Yeah, but like there's because people see the number one picks in the past twenty years. Yeah, but you have, also have picks like Nugent Hopkins, like right. like you know, there's this expectation in the NHL for. Not necessarily fans. I mean, yes, fans, but more so front offices. That the number one pick is the key to success. I mean, how often are we hearing about tanking for Bedard right now? And it's like, you know, there wasn't necessarily tanking for Lafreniere, but like the fact of the matter is, is that Bedard, anybody can end up extremely pedestrian, just like. You know, Lafreniere or, or any of these other guys. Yeah, but like it, it's also how you use them, right? Because like I, I brought up Nugent Hopkins, right? He also went to the Oilers or one first overall or something, right? You have Hall, who was a first it, overall draft pick. These these players take time. Like Nugent Hopkins is a good player now, but like he didn't just come and take the Oilers by storm. I think you have somewhere between a fifteen and twenty percent chance of a number one overall pick. Who is adequately hyped up, mind you. I'm, I'm eliminating weak draft classes here. I'm saying when there's a bona fide, understood number one overall pick. Like everybody knew Lafreniere was going to be number one. Yeah. I'd say there's still a 15 to 20% chance that that player enters the league being able to be not even a superstar, but a, 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 a Borderline star, I think potential franchise player. I think you have to that into it. it's higher if you spend his first year as a development year, even if you keep him in the NHL. Like, in the AHL? huh? You mean the AHL or NHL? Can keep If you keep him in the NHL, you need to not treat the first overall pick as a superstar until you've given him one year just trying to figure out where he is by deploying him in the right scenarios. Yeah, and I will say in terms of marketing, that's something where NHL teams who are very bad are grasping at straws an inordinate amount of time is when they have a number one overall pick, they try to sell that number one overall pick player so hard. Yeah, but you can do it in other ways level. now. Like, they... You, like, have interviews with the damn guy. Like, give him a personality, right? Stop talking to a cardboard box. Like, yeah. it's... Or or when he's on the ice, hype him up. But don't, like, put him on the ice for 20 minutes because you're literally just going to kill him. Yeah. And you know, don't, I, don't, like, if it's a center, don't make him face off against, like, the best centers in the league. Like, are you kidding me? You know, I will say, with the exception of Ovechkin and McKinnon, some of these other guys, a lot of the ones that kind of panned out are for franchises that, historically speaking, have such a high barometer of success individually to live up to. McDavid had Gretzky. Yeah. Charles but I mean, Mew. Edmonton Man has a problem. Literally anybody else. Yeah. 
So it's like, yeah, you're on a pedestal where if with some of those organizations where it's like, well, you were the top hyped guy since Lemieux. You better fucking be anywhere near as good as him. Mm -hmm. You know, you. But you're also in like markets that care more, I think. I guess like New York should care. Yeah, but they're behind the Knicks, right? Like, no. I mean, yes, but like. They're owned by the same people. Yeah. Like, um, in terms of, like, Madison Square Garden is a venue that is so uh, revered that it should sell out regardless. Yeah. Tickets are expensive. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think... Yeah, yeah but I mean, okay, Rangers. back to the point, right? Like, this is also a Knicks thing because the Rangers and Knicks both being owned by James Dolan, neither one of those teams can fucking develop talent. Yeah, this yeah, but anyway, James back to the Dolan point. Thing. So, so the Rangers picked up Tarasenko. Uh, I, I actually don't think they gave up too much. Uh, first round pick for a guy who was conditional. Lost it can seven years. It's a conditional first round pick, so. That's great. Because, um, yeah, I mean, they're still a bubble team at the end of the day, but they're probably going to be third in the... I, if I, I don't remember what the condition was, but it's not a hard condition. No, it's not. But it's still, like, I, I think, like, what, next... This coming first-round pick, is it's fine. Like, okay, whatever. And a, a fourth-round pick. Okay, sure. I mean, you can get some gems in the fourth round, but still. Take it. <laughs> Um, and then they picked up Tyler Mott from the Ottawa Senators for a, another prospect that they basically gave up on and a seventh round pick. I think they actually got a steal. So, I actually think they strengthened their team. And again, they're third in the Metro, so... And it doesn't look like they're giving that up uh, because there's a 10-point gap right now between uh, third in the Metro and the wild card. Um, yeah, I, I found the condition for the first, for, uh, okay. the first round pick, uh, since New York owns both their for own first round pick, as well as the first round pick of the Dallas stars, um, the blues will receive the later, the latter of the two picks that the Rangers have. But if the stars pick is in the top 10, the pick shifts to a 2024 first rounder. And St. Louis will receive the later of those two. Oh, okay, so the, yeah, the Rangers fucking fleece them. The the Rangers gave up nothing. The rain, yeah, the Rangers fucking fleece them. Literally, the the Blues agreed to a trade that said basically, if your first round pick is more promising for you, you get to keep. It, it was like no, the condition should have been regardless. <laughs> It should have been like, yeah, if you own picks number like nine and seventeen, you the I they, thought they I thought the condition it's like you get the later of them anyway. You I thought the condition 17. was like if if the Rangers get like sec to the second round of the playoffs, they forfeit the earlier one. But then you just kept reading no, and I was like, No, this is bad. No, the condition of the fourth round pick is that it becomes the a third rounder if the Rangers make the playoffs. Okay, so, so it's a third rounder. They're making the playoffs. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. Yeah. The Which third round picks can do something, but not a lot. <laughs> yeah, but actually, third round picks are kind of used. Like third rounders can make the NHL quite regularly. Yes. All right. So we've established that New York, the trade. Yeah. So mostly uh, for me, mostly because they. The Blues just don't know how to do a pick swap. Dude, that, that is so that bad. Like, the fact that you would be like, well, if both of your picks are in the top 10, then we don't want either of them. is just absolutely fucking stupid. <laughs> what GM fucking does that? Like, you, you're the one who's getting rid of the star player. Yeah, and, okay, also, like, it makes it weird because, like, okay, well, you still have Patrick Kane on the trade block. You still have Timo Meyer on the trade block. Yeah, and 
Uh, I guarantee you that the Rangers would be fine with moving off from one of those picks. One of those first round picks. Well, I mean, like, the, the point... The, the point is that, like, okay, well, I don't think the Rangers are... Uh, I don't even know if they can make another move, but, like, at least for Timo Meyer, you you have, like, the Jets, you have the Devils, and you have, like, two or three other teams. We've established before the show that the Sabres have the most money to play with. Yeah, but they're also the most fringe. Yeah. Yeah, because they're currently of out of a spot. I think... Currently number 20 in the NHL overall, and yes, they're out of a spot. Because for whatever reason, the Penguins are still clinging on to the depth. Yeah, but that's just because the Atlantic is top-heavy. Yeah. I mean, the Metro is also top-heavy. You have the freaking Carolina Hurricanes, Devils, and Rangers all above 75 points or something, and then you have the Penguins at 63 or something. Yeah, and then you have the Capitals, like, right behind. Yeah, at 62 or 3, and then... Just old men walking with chains. Yep. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um. That's the update for those. Maybe next episode we'll Holy talk shit. some more NHL action with trades and stuff. Holy shit, did we make that episode last. Yeah. I did not think we had an hour and 30 minutes in this. Yep. But that was a good one. I, and like when we actually hit like real talking points even though like 90 percent of the time it's mostly just us bitching about how the nhl can't throw the fucking game yep all right well thanks for tuning in and we'll catch you next time